This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. The world's in a tight spot. Build your inner fortress and achieve some peace during the chaos. Visit betterhelp.com allies to get building. Hello and welcome to the Easy Allies podcast. I'll be your moderator, Brandon Jones. Joining me this week, panelist Brad Ellis. Hi. Ben Moore. Bam, bam. And my sometimes moderator, co-moderator, Daniel Bloodworth. Hi. Thank you for filling in last <laughs> week. I was unable to be here. Jury duty and a migraine simultaneously. Oof. Something I wouldn't wish. And my worst enemy. Making it all happen wherever she is. Isla Hank, not here. We will be just doing one shot for people watching it, for audio listeners. Distinguished guests, we are here to discuss some of the biggest headlines in video games this week. But before we do that, we must answer for the mistakes we made in last week's podcast. Mr. Bloodworth, would you begin Corrections Music, please? Thank you. Two weeks worth. Here we go. The Smurfs Mission Violeaf launches in 2022 for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, specifically. Didn't mean to get those owners excited. The Maneater DLC was announced on April Fools, so the trailer didn't announce that, but we were excited to see that. Star Wars Clone Wars Lightsaber Duels was the second Star Wars fighting game. I said there was just one, mm-hmm. um, but that also was a fighting game. Is that a um, Wii game? I do, Sounds yes. Like Wii game, yeah. I don't recall it being good. Nickelodeon does not own Doug anymore. Disney bought them from Jumbo Pictures, so Disney owns Doug. Mm-hmm. Don't uh, have to be corrected on things we want, man. We're- they can make that happen. Just need the right Any, dealers. Anything is possible. Sora is still possible. Uh, mein Leben is German for my life. I think we arrived on that, but just to confirm. I said Star Wars opened in 1975. Of course, it was 1977. My brother was born in 1975. Um, I love Star Wars more than my brother, so I was very disappointed I got that wrong. Uh, Boddicker is not in Robocop 2. I don't know if I said that. That's awful. I hope I don't have to bring up Boddicker anymore. Lots of reminders that HR departments exist to help the company, not its employees, which, of course, we've been through, you know, many big companies that know. It's more of a commentary than a, a correction, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and corrections music, please. Thank you, Bloodworth. Uh, a, an update on Blizzard with, I think, uh, specifically the two of you handled very well last week. Thank you for, not only did I just, you know, dump a podcast on you, it was a, it was a doozy of a podcast. Yeah. We have a pretty light news week. Uh, but there have been lots of updates in that case. I don't think any of this really kind of changes our opinion, but feel free to weigh in if you would like. Uh, Blizzard President Jay Allen Brack emailed the staff last Thursday, said that he would be, quote, meeting with many of you to answer questions and discuss how we can move forward. Over 2,000 employees signed an open letter to their bosses. Uh, they walked out on Wednesday. A lot of other developers did as well. Uh, they list, they've listed and mentioned charities you can donate to if that's something that you want to do. Mike Morheim, Chris Metzen, of course, others have reached out at them specifically. Written statements condemning Blizzard culture. Bobby Kotick, CEO of Activision, made a comment on Tuesday. The employees responded. Uh, and employees at Ubisoft have spoken out in support of an industry-wide change, and they're trying to get into the, the zeitgeist, the rush. But again, that doesn't necessarily change sentiment. Are you kind of in the same place? Yeah. Not to open up that can yeah, of worms. Yeah, I, I don't think that, yeah, I don't think there's been anything that has changed what's happening yet. Like, the Activision response has still been pretty lukewarm to pour. <laughs> I, I do think um, pushing for industry-wide change is really the answer, because yeah. I think when these things flare up, I think it's easy, as commentators and the audience, to kind of get focused on negative sentiment on one specific company because of your own personal experience or bias or whatever it is, but this is absolutely not just a Blizzard problem, and we can't, you know, let other people skate by, which, you know, I I say that, and it's like, well, what can we really do? But what I mean is, I I think, like, if we are going to try to enact change, and these are the times that people are having conversations, my hope would be that the conversations that they're having are collaborative and that they're trying to fix fix things on on a wider scale. That is very not, hard yeah. to do, of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, that's why the walkout is so positive, you know, yeah. and so I, I, I hope that is actually noticed in a good way, you know, and, and hearing you say 2,000, because every time I hear that number, it's gone up. Yeah. Yeah. It was just for yesterday, by the time we're filming this, Wednesday. I wonder if they're going to do more days. I don't know. Because, like, a day, yeah, that's impactful, but yeah, 
But I, I mean, actually, in some ways, I mean, obviously, you need to keep pushing to have ongoing change. But mm-hmm. in some ways, like if you can get everyone coordinated for one day, mm-hmm. like that can be more effective than sure, yeah. Uh, you know, something that's going over a longer period of time that makes it harder to kind of see on a graph or something. You know, I guess the other thing about what is happening and things like the walkout is the employees are doing what they can to keep this in the news, which I also think is is helpful because the more that a spotlight is on it, the more that pressure is kept on. And, and that's that's very, very good. Yeah, it, it like it gives us something to commentate on and talk about on the next week, you know, kind of after everything blew up. Um, and just shout out to everybody making that very brave step. Shout out to a lot of people. I've seen reports from people who used to work at Blizzard now other places who are like, yeah, here was my... Mm-hmm. Here's my experience. Here's actually like some evidence, like emails I've gotten, and just kind of general, general. Yeah, time. I mean, I know it doesn't sound like much, but like just listening to people is, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. a big thing. I like listening to you last week. That was fun. <laughs> um, Annapurna has never had a showcase before. Mm-hmm. I had to double check that, mm-hmm. um, and it's always tough, uh, kind of nerve wracking, whenever someone hasn't done a showcase before. Um, even if people have done a showcase before, even someone like a Square Enix who's just like, are we, you know, are they showing up and going to show enough? Uh, Daniel Blugler is fresh off of the yeah. Annapurna showcase. Just watched it. Um, what was your overall impressions? How much of it did you know going into it? I mean, I, I kind of knew the, the bullet points because, you know, I got the press release that they, they put out afterwards um, before I got a chance to watch it myself. Uh, but yeah, if you t- comparison Square Enix or, or Capcom, like this is a much better showcase, a much much better way of going about things. Um, I was uh, I think telling either or Ben or Brad uh, earlier that like even the ones where they're just announcing a partnership with a studio mm-hmm. felt exciting mm-hmm. because of what those people have worked on in the past, uh, and they had fun with some of it. Um, the like. The, they were talking about the guys from uh, Falcon Age, you know, and one of the guys on on uh, that team at Outer Loop was like, I've been skating for 24 years and I'm terrible at it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and the new game has like skateboarding stuff in it. And they like show these like quick over the shoulder shots of the skateboarding section of this game, which currently does not have a name. And there were like three three games or so that were like that. Where hmm. they're, there's the devs, they're talking. They had uh, the uh, the dev from Gone Home and the dev from uh, Stanley Parable have teamed up to create a studio called Ivy Road, and they got this little gag for you know they talked about the composer and like who's creating the music for this trailer you're hearing right now, and so they cut to the shot of him literally <laughs> on the piano and and they you know did a couple back and forth with that and. Just yeah, they just had fun with it, and they tied it all together with a nice, slick little presentation of just kind of like this this globe. So every time they'd go to another game, another studio, they would spin the globe to where that studio is located, which I thought was a nice way of going about things. And they had a presenter from Annapurna itself at the beginning and the end, but other than that, they really didn't mix in a whole lot. They had a montage of some some games that are getting. Um, released on other platforms. Um, but otherwise, it was just like, let's go check in with this studio and this game mm-hmm. and get an update from them and a release date and first gameplay or whatever they've got for us today. Um, and uh, I thought it all flowed really well. Yeah, I think uh, this is a great thing to talk about after kind of like how heavy last week was <laughs> because um, we, we got a question of like, it was something along the lines of like, how do you keep hope in this industry? And... Annapurna, and I think this showcase really kind of crystallizes it, is like they've been crushing it for a long time, and it they look like they're just going to keep crushing it. Like, <laughs> every trailer that I watched, I was like, yes, this looks distinct. It looks unique, like, conceptually, gameplay-wise. Like, it just, everything looks so good. And they've re- honestly released, uh, I think, some of the most noteworthy games. Like, Sinar Wild Hearts was great. Outer Wilds was incredible, and it's like... They just, they've reached such a pedigree, uh, it feels like kind of on their own terms, that, that they're, they're highlighting new and original ideas, you know. It's, it's not just sequels and remakes and remasters. It is like brand new, fresh experiences. And you really get that 
uh, from some of the things that they, they showed off. Stray looks incredible. Looks like a fantastic, like really enticing world. It's kind of one of those games that you watch and you're like, I just can't wait to play more of this. And then kind of on the like opposite end, I it's Neon White. white yeah. Yes. Okay, Neon White. The gameplay trailer for that, like them going through and showing how you like use your weapons and then discard them to get a bonus and like this crazy story mode and how you can like give things to people in a bond system i was like this looks in this looks awesome like yeah. i i was really 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 impressed uh because like coming from donut county to right. this <laughs> it's like i never would have thought that you would have gone this direction and seemingly executed it so well. Yeah, so uh, Jones, like one of the, the basic examples they have of that, the card system is you have a handgun, so you can use that to shoot or you can discard it to double jump. You know, and so like these are the, the choices you're making with the cards that you pick up throughout and very, very focused on speed running. Mm-hmm. Very well. focused yeah. on speed running, but I think the smart thing that they did in the trailer, which sometimes I think developers of these kind of precise action games forget to do is he did a run where he went intentionally like much 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 slower and so you kind of like got to see him like be like oh there's that's where the enemies are oh i want to discard now and then he's like okay now we did that so like you understand how it works now we're going to look at it at full speed um and you're like i'm able to appreciate this so much more because you kind of took me through the process so very well done and not that long of a trailer, and it really had a ton in it. Mm-hmm. And their montages work because I think there's like a nice visual blend across all of their different properties. I can't remember this new studio that just announced at E3. Remember they made a big hoopla about it. They were just like, you know, here's here's a montage of all these new games. You know, some you've heard of, you didn't know that we were publishing. And it seemed like oh, you're talking about the Prime Matter one. Yes, and yeah. it seemed like they were like, we want to have you know a little bit of everything for everybody. Whereas like Annapurna definitely has a very specific style. But all their games well, kind of gel yeah, together. I mean, a, Not specific, it just all flows well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's odd because these things are all very different from each mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. Um, Stray isn't completely different than, than Neon White or Outer yeah. Wilds or mm-hmm. um, or Solar Ash, uh, which you know had a very brief... And that's that's the thing, too, that I think is nice to see something like, like, hey, we've shown you Solar Ash before. You can go back and check that gameplay if you want. We're just going to show you a little bit more, mm-hmm. and here's a release date for you. You know, and, mm. and just yeah. move on. Like, don't waste a lot of time on things. Right. So, in the stray, am I playing like a small child or like a swordsman or something? Who's the protagonist? You're playing as a cat. Oh. Um, in a world full of robots, some of them wearing like Hawaiian uh, <laughs> clothing. Of course. Now that I think about things. it, it's almost like a Ratchet and Clank situation because yep. you're also using a robot uh, companion as yeah. a as a tool. Yeah, you strap on like a little little shirt with a screen on the back, and then there's a drone that flies alongside of you. That's your way to communicate with the robots <laughs> as well as interact with things that are. You know, like opening up cabinets and things like that that the cat can't get to. Uh, and then they showed some stuff that felt like it was like, are you showing me too much now? Mm. <laughs> because there are like these like little, I don't know, like larval looking yeah. creatures that you have to avoid at first. But then they're like, once you get like this black light thing, you can just like incinerate them essentially. Mm. Just pop them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that we went so fast to potential spoilers because we haven't seen a lot of this game. Right, right. Um, yeah, that and, was... I think that's a, and that may be why, because it's like, well, how much is there to this? How I... much can you do with this cat? Yeah, and I, I certainly get the concern about potential spoilers, but what they highlighted is, like, you know, you're still a cat, and so all of these individuals are going to be able to respond to them. Like, you're going to go up, and you can hit triangle, and you can have a unique interaction with somebody. And so I think that's really where, like... Kind of the joy of this game is going to be yeah. not just that, like, you're fighting these things, but all of those small moments that uh, will kind of make you smile and let up. And so I think as long as, like, not too many of those are ruined. It got delayed, too, I think, to next year. It was supposed to be this year. Uh, yeah, it's in 2022 for so sure. I don't maybe know early, if there's a delay early or not. Yeah. Maybe they wanted to show yeah. off a little more. Just because they know it's like, hey, you're gonna have to wait yeah. a little longer, but here you go. Here's a little more of it. Well, just every time you would pop up in a PlayStation montage and be like, when are we gonna see that cat? So, mm-hmm. like, when are we actually gonna yeah. get kind of a deep dive into that game? Yeah, and now we have. So um, there you go. And you know, I always get excited to see cats, but like that cat in particular. And of course, Isla goes out of town, and Out of Wilds gets the expansion that mm-hmm. we heard about for so long. Yeah, 
She knew this was going to happen, though. We right. all knew yeah. this mm-hmm. was going to happen. Right. Yeah, Isla's yeah. actually uploading her own reactions. Just Excellent. Just solo, yeah. yeah. Um, are we nervous about this at all? Would this be? I, re- I remember, you know, not to paraphrase Isla, but she, you know, kept saying, I can't imagine how, you know, not to get de- into the story, but I can't imagine how it that's going to operate. straight up says there is more to explore. Mm-hmm. And considering how smart Outer Wilds is, I'm sure they'll do just fine. Did you, did you see the presentation itself? Like, they they know that people are very spoiler apprehensive of this, so there's, like, you know, and you might, if you played the game, you might be wondering, how? Why? It's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then yeah. that's it. He yeah. It, you know, and then he rolls a trailer that doesn't seem to mean anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think there's anything to be nervous about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jones, I didn't. I did not like that game as much as everyone else did. I did not finish it, granted, mm-hmm. but I did not enjoy it as much as everyone else. But this kind of gives me a maybe another, like, slight kindling of me maybe revisiting this game. I'm like, maybe there's something more to this yeah. game I should investigate. No, I, I mean, I, I got close enough, you know, to the core of that game to know, like, okay, there's a lot more going on right. here that I have not, you know... Um, yeah, it was, it was just kind of the starting, not to really get, you know, get into specifics on Out of Wilds, just kind of like the starting and stopping. I was like, I'm going to head over there, but I don't know if I'm going to spend 20 minutes actually accomplishing anything or am I just going to mm. <laughs> bump into something. Um, but I think that's a big deal. I remember when I first saw this rundown, I was like, Outer Wilds expansion and, you know, a nice deep dive into Stray. We got a show. That's great. You know, a yeah. couple of announcements and some other, you know, gameplay but, reveals and release dates and stuff. Yeah, I mean, but a lot of the, like I said, a lot of these people that are excited, that I'm excited about that I wouldn't have even thought of, right? Mm. So like... No code, the guys that did observation. You know, you remember that one with the mm-hmm. space station? Like, you are the space station. And it's fun they had this funny comment where they were saying it's like, We never really set out to make horror games. Like we were make, just making sci fi and then people were like, That game was terrifying. So this time we're actually going to make a horror game. Yes. Yeah, it's fun. So I was like, All right, that one for that. And then uh, Jessica Mack, uh, Everyday Shooter, do you remember this? Like mm-hmm. way back, early PS3, and like downloadable games were still kind of a new thing. And it was sort of Geometry Wars-esque, but there's like a lot of like guitar going on. Um, and then oh. Sound Shapes. Oh, sound Shapes I remember is sound so shapes. sick. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, I love Sound Shapes. And it was, just, it was just like her on camera and just like just being totally humble. Like you would have, if you didn't remind me of those games, like I would have thought she was making her first game. And was just super nervous about it, you know. But <laughs> it was like, this is, oh yes, I want, I want more from this person. I have enjoyed both of those games. Uh, it was Freedom Games, I think, also kind of had that personal touch, you know, yeah. with these three that we really like mm-hmm. appreciated. Uh, it's nice too. Again, just why it's nice for Annapurna to to get to do a showcase. It's nice for the studio to be built up. Uh, two games announced: a memoir, Blue. From Cloister Interactive, mm-hmm. a poignant story of a mother and daughter experienced through memories cherished and memories suppressed. Um, that game looked so cool because you're, it, it showed her like sitting on the subway, but she was underwater, and then you, you see her like being able to move through it, and she gets up, and then you, you see presumably like her when she's younger and her mother, but it's a the game is in 3D. It's all modeled out, but then you see like a nice like hand drawn two D image kind of fade in as a memory, yeah. and that kind of like juxtaposition of styles uh, was was really neat. It was just very visually striking. Storyteller, mm-hmm. this is interesting. A unique and creative spin on the puzzle genre in which players are given a variety of iconic characters, settings, and emotions to build tales of love, betrayal, and revenge. From supernatural fantasies and Shakespearean tragedies to myths of creation, players must use their wits to retell iconic tales or find something new. I do find the phrase, a twist on the puzzle genre, interesting because I feel like the puzzle genre can be just about anything. Mm -hmm. You should probably have some twists in there if you're making a a puzzle Uh, game. Yeah, this is really neat. Uh, So imagine essentially like a comic strip, right? You've got a bunch of empty panels and then there's there's a title. And, and then there's a bunch of pieces at the bottom. And so essentially you have to assemble those pieces in a way that creates a story that like justifies the title. Hmm. Dude, Comic Zone spiritual successor. <laughs> We've been kind of the getting there, zone, yeah. There's, yeah. There's been some fun iPad you know, games that like might have gotten ported over to PC where like, they're, they're puzzle based and you basically have to like you know, construct right. the story right. and then you see it animate. And so the first example that they showed was just two panels. And it was like something like uh, a tale of tragedy. And so they took like a man and a woman and put them in the first panel, and then they put a man and a gravestone, and then they put the woman's face on the gravestone for the second panel, and then that that's it. There's, there's your story. 
hmm. you know. Uh, but they had some others that I saw like went like six panels deep. Um, and one of the to- topics was uh, cured from vampirism. Excellent. <laughs> and another one was uh, the Queen Marys. So, yeah, it, you know, it, it's, it'll be very interesting to see how all that works together and just how dynamic it can be or, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. you can see that if it's too constrained, that could be really frustrating. Right? It's like, what exactly need, I, I think I've got it. This, to me, makes sense. Um, but it really just depends on, like, how they make all that logic work and how it recognizes what the player is intending to do with the tools that they have at hand. Uh, we don't, do we have dates for either of those? I don't think they gave us dates. Uh, let me see on Check the notes. Release. Yeah. Artful Escape announced its cast and release date, September yeah, 9th. That's crazy. Jason Schwartzman and Carl Weathers finally making a movie together, finally <laughs> working on something together. Yeah, the cast is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they put uh, release dates on those. Solar Ash is on October 26th. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about it. I'm also worried about that release date. <laughs> so for that oh, game in particular? Tricky time. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for a smaller yeah. game to come out, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then some stuff is moving around. I Am Dead's coming to PlayStation Xbox mm-hmm. on August 9th. What Remains of Edith Finch is coming to the App Store on August Ooh. 16th. Uh, the path, be- I love that game so too. much. Very good. <laughs> I have, yeah, that's like my, it reminds me of like, I have Knights of the Republic on my phone. No intention to play it, but like, I might be in, I might there. be in a plane crash. I might wind up in some deserted island and just with enough battery, I'm like, I'm gonna go hours, out yeah. playing Kotor. Let's do it. <laughs> I feel like I, got, I you know, I Final fiddled. Fantasy Tactics. Like, yeah. let's go. I fiddled with Kotor on iPad and it was okay. Yeah, it was <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we got a uh, new skin deep gameplay. Um, see, so yeah, I thought it was a good show. I thought it was a good mix of those announcements and even stuff you know that I hadn't initially mm-hmm. seen, like you were talking about. Uh, um, Lots of fun new, uh, not only games being announced, but lots of projects and teams coming together this week that we can chat about. Yeah. But um, I thought it was good. When do you think we'll see another? Do you think Annapurna is going to show up for like an E3 or like around another major event? Or I, w- I would. I mean, it's hard when it's their first one, but I would guess that this is this is like their E3 showcase. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. this is the first time doing it. They're going to have a summer thing. You know, they're going to try it out, and uh, yeah, I just really. Really like what they're doing. I, you know, I'm curious whether, uh, and again, I said something I was saying before the podcast. I'm curious whether there's staff over there that used to be at Sony Santa Monica when when they were doing this kind of thing for PlayStation, because just so many of the people that they're working with seem to be, you know, either the same people or in that same vein uh, of those kinds of artful experiences. You mm-hmm. know, um, you know, they, you know, they're doing Pathless, you know, and Sony Santa Monica, you know, had Journey, so it's just like, right. Yeah, you know, Jessica Mack. That's similar connection. So I, I, I do wonder if, if they they have some of those staff over there. I, I think I'm also impressed because uh, we are not want for indie showcases, especially like in this year, like E3. There's just a right. lot of lot of really solid collections. You know, even like Gorilla, which I you know still have yet to catch up on, like everything that they did during E3. So it's just like you know, kudos to that you know their team to. Show off stuff to have some gameplay for stuff we haven't seen in a while yeah. and some fun new announcements. And not too much. And not too much, yeah. A good length. Not as surprising. Uh, the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X are all doing very well. Uh, but we have more specifics this, this week, and what's interesting is um, these are both coming out almost like right at the same time. So I'm just curious to do a check-in on how the PlayStation has been doing, how Xbox has been doing, and then we don't have to talk about it again for a while. The PlayStation 5 has sold 10 million units. Uh, it launched, of course, on November 12th. Uh, that is the fastest selling anything in the Call history of Sony, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but is on on par with, you know. I wonder know, what the slowest selling thing is. You never hear yeah, about I wonder, that. Yeah, I uh, wonder, for like a certain amount of time. Well, because it, it's always an amount of time. Phillips? We're talking about a weekend, a week, a month, a year. Um, <laughs> Right. And is it still in production? Could we turn that around? Mm -hmm. Uh, So I have some other specific games that they mentioned. Uh, There's a lot going on on PlayStation. Obviously, PlayStation Studios is up to a lot of these stuff. We did not get uh, any figures on Destruction All-Stars. Yes. No, we did not. Even though apparently they're overhauling that a little bit. We might not be impressed with those numbers. Let me know if you're impressed with any of these numbers or surprised. Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales has sold more than 6.5 million copies. That also released on November 12th with... uh, 
the PlayStation 5? I think that is impressive. I'm not yeah. surprised, right. but I do think it is impressive. Very impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I raised the question because I'm not sure if the two of you were on the podcast when I brought this up, but mm. how far are we? How far is this train going? How many? Oh, Spider Man 3, Spider Man 4, Spider Man oh, 5, yeah. Spider Man 6. Look at the ratchet Does it train. Does <laughs> splinter off into other things? Does it become its own MCU? I like, wouldn't how... be surprised, Jones, if eventually they did a different superhero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. Avengers was like, no, no, we're yeah, all Yeah, Marvel's thing. Like, like, they know they can do well, their IPs justice. I mean, that would be so exciting. Can you imagine how that would sell? Where it's like they've got, you know, multiple Spider Man games under their belt. Presumably, let's say they're all well received. And then the next one they announce is some team of collaboration, which is very common for comic books and Spider Man specifically. Yeah, I think it's going to be going for a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's going to be going for oh, a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's no way. Uh, and they, they they can take as much time as they want with mm-hmm. Spider-Man 2 because I'm very excited yeah, oh yeah. about that. I like a world games. I like superhero games. I'm in a good mood when it there comes to that game success. There is something funny about calling it Spider-Man 2 that just makes, <laughs> like, sure. it, it, it's so locked to the Sam Raimi movie for me. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> will it be better? Will it dethrone the Spider-Man 2? Yes. Will somebody late, will somebody three or four years from now bring up the Sam Raimi film and you're like, that was a good game. And they're like, no, I meant the movie. And oh, like, yeah. That it happened. Happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It happened. MLB The Show 21 from San Diego Studios, the fastest selling title in franchise history. Well, it was multi-plat now. Yeah. With so more than 2 million helps. copies uh, across all platforms. The game has reached more than 4 million players since releasing on April 16th. Damn. So. Sorry, I was thinking about Spider-Man. What game did you say? MLB The <laughs> Show. Oh, okay. That's probably why I missed it. And it was on Game Sports games, <laughs> like, I, I, must, I think I have like a like Fa- filter in my brain for The fastest games. selling title in franchise history. What was the slowest uh, selling MLB the show? I don't have it. 17. Um, but who is Blood, do you have anybody that wants you want to be spooked by that that is looking at, you know, them taking a, an exclusive sports title or a very limited sports title, bringing it to other people, uh, you know, taking it across platforms, mm. shaking hands. I don't know. It's it, it's sort of, you know, to be expected in a way because yeah. If uh, the other MLB games aren't selling that hot, then MLB wants mm-hmm. wants to get more of that dough. Uh, Returnal has sold more than 560,000 copies since releasing on April 30th. It deserves, nice. it it deserves, deserves more. That's a hard, that was such a hard sell for a lot yeah, of people, too. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Game, yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, it's a roguelike and $70, a new IP. Don't forget, so. don't forget about Returnal, dear but it's audience. Great. It's, it's very great. Good. How can Sony make people not forget about Returnal? Um, I think you, you can do a lot of things. So like, you know, we're creeping up into fall, we're creeping up into award season. Um, I think we're, we're, you know, we have the fall rush and then we have the award season where of course we, cause it's our job, get caught up on a lot of things, but I think a lot of players do as well. I mm-hmm. think a lot of people kind of look at their backlogs or like look at things they've missed and, uh, give things a chance, and I think a great way to do that, like the PS, the PlayStation Store is so integrated in the PS5 that like you turn that thing on, and you're getting, you know, selected things thrown at you, and so I think they could definitely bring it up and highlight it, and I don't know, could do a sale, yeah, could, could have some sale. small DLC thing, yeah, it's just yeah. like a couple items or something. I haven't played Returnal. I am curious to check it out. It did bring me some satisfaction though, because you said it was hard and you were uh, mm-hmm. having, having trouble with it. Yeah, and I enjoyed oh, that. Extremely I enjoy Brad having a hard time with games <laughs> yeah. because I have a much harder time with games <laughs> that um, he does not have a hard time with. You know, it'd be funny is if <laughs> for PS5 games now, they were like, we don't know when the PS6 is going to happen. We're not even. We have no idea, but if you buy this, we'll give you a free upgrade to the PS6. Like, oh, <laughs> sick! <laughs> that might mean anything. <laughs> Uh, but that reminds me of how frustrated anyone who does not have a PlayStation 5 is with the segment and how yep. quickly they skip yep, ahead to yep, the yep, next yep, thing. Yep. They're like, I do not yeah, need I to know. know. I know. That, that they've broken every record they wanted to break without delivering one to my house. That's But that's the craziest part about it, right? Like, I, I feel like this comes up a lot when we have, you know, these, uh, you know, like really hot systems you know, like with the Wii. Like, people are like... Oh, you know, that's artificial shortages. It's like, no, they're not artificial shortages. They're making as many as they possibly can. Um, and, and yeah, like when, when you're saying they're, like, they're, they're breaking records on everything with the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox, and yet they're still not able to just get them into stores. Right. Just put it on a shelf somewhere. Not happening. I mean, I'm sure it, it is immensely frustrating that there have been shortages, and that sucks just straight up. But I imagine if you're like dead set on getting a PS5 or Xbox or whatever it is, 
these conversations may still be interesting to you. Oh, you of know? course, mm-hmm. yes. Like, I just want to just want to sprinkle a little empathy out there. And the yeah. Switch is in the yeah, yeah. mix too because it's still it's selling kind of ridiculously for where it is in its life cycle. It right. it is a truck that keeps on trucking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It also brings me a lot of joy because every now and then you'll just see PlayStation loves retweeting these where just somebody's like, "I got what?" and like that, you mm-hmm. know, the look on their face, like mm-hmm. somebody winning, you know, championship. Um Looking ahead, the lineup of exclusive games coming from PlayStation Studios includes A New God of War, did you know, from Santa Monica Studios, Gran Turismo 7 from Polyphony Digital, which I, why do I keep forgetting that that's even, I don't that even Gran Turismo's had? We just don't get a lot of updates on that. Yeah, Gran Turismo takes a long time. Horizon Forbidden West from Guerrilla Games. Some of the highly anticipated games from the, our partners include Battlefield 2042, Deathloop, Far Cry 6, and Kana Bridge of Spirits. Interesting from their partners. Mm-hmm. Anybody... You thought might be on that list or anything? I thought you're they excited would say about on PlayStation Final Fantasy 16 or something because it's a PlayStation 5 exclusive right now. Yeah, but maybe they're just holding off till they're actually going to show more I of just, the game. I just think it's funny throwing something like God of War in there, and you know, it it reminds me of when they were advertising Spider Man before Spider Man came out, and it's like, what? Why is this in a commercial? Mm-hmm. This game's not going to well, be out like, for like a year and a half. It's like you, when they have Master Chief on stuff, you know? Right. Like Halo's so far away. Yeah. I, I think God of War is like one of those few it's instances where it's like the you know the 2018 God of War did so well and was so tied to the PlayStation brand that like however long it ends up taking, like it is an inevitability. Right? Mm-hmm. Like it's yeah. – and so I think I think in that case it's it's kind of – Fair. Like it's like saying like Square is going to make make another Final Fantasy, right? Like it's ju- it's just you you may not know right. exactly what it's going to be, but it's just so essential to them. That but they kind of yeah they kind of announced it, but not announced it. So it's funny to see it just kind of like it's like dark matter. It's like we can't see it, we can see where it's been. You know, we yeah. follow the trail of this game. <laughs> That's what I mean though. Is I think you can be playful with it. Like right. it's so big that you can just show mm-hmm. a logo, and it's like. That generates excitement. But, that, but that's what's funny is because now, as more time has passed since that reveal, it's like, oh, that's I guess that's not the name of the game? <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> well, I love people having to write... Ragnarok yeah. in print. I've seen the unannounced God of War sequel is what a lot of... Right. You know, that kind of seems to be the common perception across, mm. you know, people writing headlines and stuff, mentioning it in italics and paragraph form. But I loved it in here specifically from them. A new God of War. A new God of War. You know, like just very generic. You know that thing. Um, but uh, obviously that's going to be massive. Not to lump this together at the same time, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, the whole thing, not just that silly games division, uh, which is itself in its own entertainment digital division, on a Q4 earnings call this week said, quote, we continue to lead in the fast-growing cloud gaming market with last month. Just last month, we made Xbox cloud gaming available on PCs as well as Apple phones and tablets via the browser in 22 countries with more to come. Millions have already streamed games to their desktops, t- desktops tablets, and phones. And the Xbox Series X and S try this immediately. are our fastest-selling consoles ever, with more consoles sold live to date than any previous generation. Video games are popular. Woo! Everybody wins. Yep. Um, yeah. So are things just going to get out of control when these things finally do hit the shelves? Are we going to just have install bases bigger than anything we've ever seen? Well, the, the thing that I'm curious about is, like, Game Pass has really snowballed, I think, in terms of presence. And I'm curious where, you know, xCloud is... is what the the timeline is going to be on that? If it will have like a similar trajectory, like, and and how we're going to be talking about a year from now? Like, I, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, they're obviously both very excited. It's interesting to see they're both. This has happened before, where Sony and Microsoft kind of this that there's not a lot of obviously they're competing against each other. There's not a lot of competitive rhetoric. They're both just kind of like you know. Mm-hmm. Microsoft is everywhere in your digital life, and a lot of people have PlayStation 5s. So mm-hmm. It's like both of those are true, and both of those are yeah. something that you know you can be happy about. Um, it, cu- it, is a, it is annoying, and then, like obviously you understand why they do it, but it's, it is annoying that Xbox doesn't actually give hard numbers. You know, 147 percent mm-hmm. higher than you know, and it's like, well, yeah, then what? And you know, people like try to do the math and sort it out, and it's like this is probably about where they're at, but it's just. Uh, Q4 yeah. revenue for Xbox was up 353 million. Gaming revenue was up 11%. 11%, Brad. 11%. Damn. 
But that eleven percent is off of last mean? year, which was already right big for every. You know, that's the thing. Like, and these are fiscal years, so it's always like Q four. We, we're sustaining numbers from twenty twenty across all three of these um, ecosystems is is pretty nuts. Um, just looking ahead at this year, I'm curious to see kind of in total what uh, you know at the next fiscal year. Obviously, how long it's going to take, you know, people to. Depending on who you ask, we could be going into another pandemic or coming out of a pandemic. Um, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see manufacturing-wise. I just think back to the end of 2020, we thought the manufacturing woes were really, really going to cost Microsoft and PlayStation. Mm-hmm. We thought Cyberpunk was going to have a good launch. We didn't know what the hell was going on in Q3 2020. Um, did both these companies get lucky, or do you think they're both playing their own respective games? I mean, just in terms of... Like what I said, like I, I thought they were really going to take a hit with, you know, being able to get these in people's hands. But no, no, not at all. I mean, there, there's that's that's a loaded question because there's a lot to talk about with that question specifically. We could spend a whole podcast talking about it. But you know, we it, as we've commentated on in the past, I think Sony has really done a stellar job of making exclusive software that people want to play, and I think Microsoft has done a stellar job of giving. Uh, access to games in a way uh, that is really valuable to people. And I think both of those are paying off. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing is, you know, you think about the pandemic and it's like, what else are you going to do besides play video games? And so I think it, I think like in terms of that thing, you can, people are probably spending more time in 2020 staying indoors, consuming entertainment, that sort of thing. So. I definitely think that helps, especially since things, you know, can be delivered right to your door. You can buy games online, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I had, I love checking in with friends that only play certain games or have just a very limited, you know, perspective on the industry, but are extremely devoted to games and spend a lot of time doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, My two friends are on a FIFA team, a full multiplayer FIFA team. So things like 11 v 11 or something. Crazy. We're like 22 players. And so they have their positions and they talk to everyone that is on their team. Uh, and they were like, are we all getting a you know, Xbox Series X? And they're like, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. No question. We're all getting them. It's like, do any of you play any other game than FIFA? Like, nope. I'm just kidding. I mean, for <laughs> a lot of people, it's, it's, it's just one game yeah. Yeah, that gets them to, to purchase a console. Um, when the world ends, though, when the apocalypse right. happens, right. we will be divided. Our clans will be different. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Mm. But that's what I'm saying. I'll have, you know, Final Fantasy Tactics on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have Kotor plans for, I'll have Kotor, plans for Zombies 1 and 2. Yeah. I'll be fine. I'm good. What, what do you do when the charge in the, the phone vault. runs out, though? Uh, it's g- Go to war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go to war. But I, I, the gr- the know, great battery war of 2030. Um, I, I think, too, that there's... I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But I think there's more openness to people to getting both as well. You know, I think people can do see the value in getting both of these systems, you know, with, with these ecosystems, you know, with, I mean, Game Pass alone kind of justifies getting an Xbox. I totally know. see what you're saying, Blood, because yeah. I thought the same thing, and I was going to say that, but then I was like, well, we're all in our 30s with full-time jobs. Like, that can't be the case for, you know, college kids, kids at high school, Middle school, even you know, whatever it is. Sure, but I don't know if that's the early adopter, you know, first wave of purchases as much. Right. Uh, But I'm just saying, like, I don't know for sure. And so I'd love to see, like, that breakdown in a graph, Mm. you know, and who who is buying these. Yeah. True. Demographics. From Ryan Smiles on Patreon. Who has the easier job, the head of Sony or Microsoft? Don't think about these people. Uh. <laughs> think about having this job. If you were to wake up tomorrow and you would have either one of these jobs, which one would you want to have? Neither. Man. You have to. I mean, I'll take this one. Is like a, <laughs> this is like an 80s movie, a reversal of fortune. Easier job. Here's an easier job. I have no idea what the job entails, I guess. Neither do I. Well, both companies, like you're saying head of Sony in its entirety, right? Uh, the, the head of Sony's PlayStation oh, division. The head of Sony, division. yeah, and, of and Sony Microsoft. Head of PlayStation or, and, and head of Xbox? And head of Xbox. Okay. I would pick. If I think just, that's a more interesting question. But. If it's just PlayStation and Xbox, I would pick PlayStation. Mm. Uh, just simply for the fact that a it is doing extremely well, and it has been going on even longer than the Xbox, and doesn't seem any PlayStation just as a brand seems eternal. Right. I think. Yeah, I think in a way, you know, because we talk about the whole 
just this weird divide we had before launch where the like the, you know PlayStation's like we believe in generations and Xbox is like we want you to play everything you've ever had um, and so I think in a way PlayStation has it easier in some sense that they sort of already have a roadmap mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know and they they know kind of what they want to do they know kind of how they're going to move forward they have a new god of war <laughs> yeah and and they they will react when you know customers kind of push them to react mm-hmm. uh what Xbox is doing with Game Pass and with b- buying all these studios, like they're having to kind of like make it up as they go along, you know. Like, mm-hmm. there's still these questions of like, is Game Pass this? Is Game Pass profitable? Will Game Pass be profitable? It seems sort of very opaque from the outside as to how the heck this even works in their favor. It seems like a scarier position to be in. Yeah, yeah, that's a good sure. point. Yeah. yeah, I think I would probably pick PlayStation because it depends how long I would be. At Xbox, but eventually you're gonna have to name the successor to the Xbox Series X and S, and like that's that's not gonna be a fun meeting or series <laughs> yeah, of meetings. The PlayStation Six, it's just such that it's like a warm blanket, you know, you just really? that assurance. I feel like I'd be more confident in decisions that I would make if I was head of PlayStation. I know what people would want, like like first thing in the job, like hey, let's make Silent Hill happen now, like let's do it. People really want that. Let's make let's Silent get... Hill happen. Let's bring back Parappa. But like some of those games, I don't know if they'll have the same impact on Xbox or something like that. Right, like especially yeah. a lot, of, I think about a lot of the Japanese games that end up on Xbox. They, sh- they could do well now, but they never seem to take off quite as they do on PlayStation. Yeah. If PlayStation made a new console but didn't number it, gave it some goofy name. Ooh. Do you think then afterwards they would go back and be like, "Oh, next one's PlayStation 6. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you the story of the PlayStation Vita. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, PSP 2 would have been cool. Yeah, yeah. The Vita was their sauciest name. That was yeah. the, literally as yeah. far as they went out. And look yeah. what happened. Horrible was and very, look what happened. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that was very descriptor, like, a, like your printer or something. Variety has reported that a live-action Pokemon series is in development from Lucifer's Joe Henderson. Uh, now, watch Lucifer. Uh, Netflix really wants me to. Um, but there, I, I, there are a lot of effects on that show, mm-hmm. uh, and um, I did actually get to see this. But with the, you know, we, I'm curious if you think Ben that they they have kind of proved that this could potentially work uh, because we had a live action film that I was very nervous about before I actually saw it. And enjoyed Brandon, it. I am as conflicted on this as I think I could be because so let's break this down into like Ben's pros and cons. The pros are I enjoyed Detective Pikachu way more than I was. Mm-hmm. than I thought I was going to. And so they, they, they have kind of proven that they can do it. Um, but the other thing is, is like they have the Pokemon anime, which is absolutely eternal and going to go on forever. But there are just, there are Pokemon fans that like have kids now or, you know, are, are returning to Pokemon or whatever it is who are probably checked out of the anime no matter what. It's just like, they're just... They're not going to be the type of Pokemon fan that is going to sit down and watch the anime, but they maybe would watch a brand new live action storyline. So I think there's a huge market there of like kind of casual Pokemon fan that Detective Pikachu uh, showed. And so I think from a business perspective, it's extremely smart. Now, in the cons, as much as I liked De- Detective Pikachu, I don't know how much more of it I want. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, it was fun, and it was cute, and I had a good time, but it wasn't amazing. Like, it was just, it had the benefit of being better than I expected. Like, I enjoyed it more than I expected. But I can't imagine how I would feel, hypothetically, after, like, movie four. You know what I mean? And so, right. I think, I just worry that They'll take something that is potentially a good idea and, and maybe just run it a little bit farther than it should be run. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do about this? Right. Se- like, what is this series going to be about? Is it going to be a kid being a trainer or something like that? It's like, right. how long is that going to go on? How long can you do that? I, I think it could be eternal. I mean, yeah. You know, ben said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I don't know about that. I think what I would do is. And this, you know, they just launched 
uh, Sword and Shield, right? And so not that long, not just, but not that long ago, you know, Sword and Shield and those recent mainline entries. I would tie in, I think it would be neat to have a tie-in show like around the launch of a new Pokemon game because when a new mainline Pokemon game comes out, mm -hmm. it is exciting. Like it's an event. It's it's It consumes the news. It's what everybody's talking about. You get brand new Pokemon that are revealed. It's so, so, so neat. And so to have a show accompany that and maybe like even come out like a week or two before that kind of gives you an inside look into the world and maybe like an alternate perspective, that could be really neat. And so that's what I would love. But it's not going to be that. It <laughs> I think that's rare because then they can just kind of dismiss it. And they're just like, for, for anybody that's like, wait, that doesn't really kind of add up if you think about what yeah. I know about the, the world. And you're like, well, no, it's a different. Sure. It's another yeah. thing. Another dimension. Multiverse. It, it's a complex thing to do for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I really worry about taking like a bunch of liberties and like doing things. And I think of like the Resident Evil movies. I'm just like, mm -hmm. God damn you guys like what are you doing with this <laughs> right. it's like are you gonna do stuff that pokemon fans hate or something i don't know yeah you know what? it's 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 funny you bring up resident evil because it's like i don't know what narrative highs i'm looking for here <laughs> you know i'm for, not even for, looking like, for highs but i'm just looking something somewhat faithful <laughs> to the games and capturing the feeling of the game because right. I, I think something that detective pikachu had going for it and part of what made it entertaining for me was Seeing <laughs> sometimes good, sometimes Bad. horrible, like CG monstrosities <laughs> right. that right. those Pokemon pocket monstrosities, <laughs> yes, pocket monstrosities <laughs> that those things uh, turned out to be, right? But you really don't have that novelty anymore. Like we've we've seen you do it, we've right. kind of gotten over that shock, um, and I think that that's something that the the anime has going for it. Because you, Brandon, you mentioned you know just Pokemon fans being like, wait, that doesn't really work, it doesn't really line up. Um, the anime, you know, the humans look like the they belong in the world of Pokemon because there's a consistent animated style going on there. And so I don't know I don't know how it's gonna work Dude, in like an extended series. If you mess up the way the Pokemon look, it's gonna be so bad for that show. Mm -hmm. I just right. think of like the Sonic the Hedgehog thing from his original it. design. They fixed it. You run them through the ring. But I'm talking about Pokemon. Like, but, if these Pokemon don't look good, you're done. But I, I think if you have, even have, like, ugly CG Pokemon, you can kind of get away with it in a movie because it's like, oh, I just want to see what happens and I'm out. I think it's harder to commit to, like, a full series of The novelty of runs up, wears off for me. Right, just yeah, seeing them. absolutely. Like, so I'm there, seeing, a, like, a gross Pikachu for ten episodes. Right. It's going to be not good. And so it, it really will come down to the storytelling and, and where they end up going there. And you know what? I've said this a thousand times and I'll say it again because it bears repeating. If you told me beforehand that they were making, before I watched it, they were making a Castlevania animated <laughs> show. Right. I would have been like, that's probably going to be a bummer. <laughs> um, now, I, I honestly think that that's probably one of my favorite shows Ever. Like, I've, I've just gotten so much enjoyment from it. Well, no other gaming thing has kind of lived up to to that. And so I wonder yeah. I wonder if... I thought Witcher was pretty good. I wonder if things... Uh, specifically animated. So, like, I sure, wonder sure. if... And just kind of, like, the the onslaught. I think we're getting of a lot of different properties. I'm going to, you know, go into yeah. them. Uh, we've talked about it a lot. So I wonder if this just yeah. kind of automatically becomes the cream of the crop or if it has to prove <laughs> I itself. I like, the, the complex storyline in a Pokemon TV show. Definitely. Definitely. It, it, but, I, but you can... It's possible. It is possible. Right. I think that's actually the issue that I had with the last couple of Pokemon games that I played is it had enough plot to fill about eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> and then the rest mm -hmm. of it was me just, just running around, yeah. you know, discovering new things. I um, mean, the games, the games, I mean, to be fair, the games have explored some interesting topics, right? Like one of the interesting topics is like how ethical is it of what we're doing to Pokemon? You could build an entire show around that and explore it in a way that I don't, think the pacing of a Pokemon game where you're given so much freedom and, and there's so many mechanical things to dig into could maybe like narratively focus in on as much. So you can do it, but I don't know. The, the, the thing with Netflix, right? Like Annapurna is a great example. Annapurna, it's like, oh man, like I can think of like all of these quality things that they've done. Like you think about uh, like a, a streaming show. Streaming shows are just such a crapshoot. It's just like you... 
It's it's with me. It's like fifty fifty. Like net, take Netflix for example. I watch something on Netflix and I'll be like, that was fantastic. The next thing I watch on Netflix, that was garbage. And it just kind of goes on forever because mm. it's so vast and it's only getting bigger. So it's really hard to just like sit here and think, you know, without any proof of concept, other than I guess Detective Pikachu, like how this is going to turn out. Hope for the best. Hope for the best. I want to watch it. Like no matter what, I want to watch it. Documentaries are the worst, man. I hate just being 15 minutes into a documentary on Netflix. I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm into the story, but yeah. like, this is a bad movie. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to watch this anymore. But you can't tell because it takes about 10 minutes just to learn what the heck's going on in a mm -hmm. documentary. I, th I, I expect I will fall in love with the show quicker than that. And now, a word from our sponsors. No, no, don't change the lights. I got this. <laughs> This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Life is full of stressors. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have, your life is probably stressful. You may not be feeling down and out depressed or like you're at a total loss, but if your stress is high, your temper is shorter than usual, or even if you're starting to feel strain in any of your relationships, you could probably use the chance to unload. Unload the stress and get it out. Talk to someone who's completely unbiased about your life, someone who isn't going to judge you or take sides on anything. When there are things you can't tell anyone or feel like you can't unload to family and friends, you need to unload it and that's what therapy can be. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Easy Allies listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash allies. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash allies. If you don't want a therapist, we can get you an orthodontist. There's a specialist for just about everything, right? When a car breaks down, you go to a mechanic. When there's a problem with the shower, you call the plumber. So when you want to get your uneven, crooked teeth fixed, you see an orthodontist. They're the specialists, and that's what sets Candid, the invisible, comfortable, and removable aligners above the rest. I have not used Candid, but every single night before I go to bed, I put these things in my mouth so that my teeth don't get crooked, uh, and the technology is absolutely crazy nowadays. While poorly reviewed or insanely priced clear aligner companies use general dentists, Candid only works with orthodontists. With Candid, the same orthodontist who created your plan is with you from start to finish, so you never have to wonder how you're doing. Your treatment is prescribed and closely monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement. You can buy, you can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you or do everything from the comfort and convenience of your own home. It's just like you buy an Xbox Series X, you get Candid all set, you don't have to go anywhere. You can set it all up at home. And with your aligner treatment, you get Candid's teeth whitening for free. The average Candid treatment is just six months. You'll start seeing results way before then. Six months, man. Yeah, wow. I think for my whole life I've worn braces, maybe for five, four and a half, five years? six months. Uh, Candid can help you get the straighter, brighter smile you've always wanted. I'm not jealous or anything. Right now, you can save $75 on your Candid starter kit when you get started from home, or you can book an appointment at Candid Studio near you today. Go to candidco.com slash easyallies and you'd use code easyallies. That's candidco.com slash easyallies, code easyallies. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 off your starter kit. Candidco.com slash easyallies and the code Easy Allies. And if you are a patron of Easy Allies, thank you. Hey, Blood, have you heard about Splitgate? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You heard about it now. <laughs> such, a, such a great response. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you know about it before this week? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the PR companies. Yeah, they, 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 they bug us about a lot of things. They, they work with a lot of people. So you read these emails that we get, do you? Yeah. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah. it's been doing really well. Yeah. Too well. So you've heard about Splitgate. Yes. What's, what has Splitgate been up to? Splitgate is a it's portal FPS where you literally have a portal gun, but you shoot people in through it. It's multiplayer. So think just your portal gun, your blue, your orange, but you can use that in combat while trying to take down other players. Went into early access in 2019. Uh, we have to figure out a genre, like a new name for these things that they're like, we've been around for two, three years among us. Like, mm -hmm. thanks for checking it out now. I don't know what just happened. Uh, specifically, this recently got crossplay on PlayStation and Xbox. Uh, 1047 Studios, or it might be 1047, uh, is the team putting this together. When it went crossplay on PlayStation and Xbox, their servers could not handle it at all. 
Uh, they shut down. Uh, they went offline to fix things, came back. A couple days later, went offline again. Then Human Capital, a venture capital firm, stepped in. They're giving them $10 million to uh, presumably update their servers or uh, their infrastructure. Um, and uh, they're going to be officially launching soon. Um, but I think the story is fascinating because everyone's pretty positive on this. Mm-hmm. And yet it did the thing that is so easy to for a lot of people to review bomb or just get upset at something else that's launching and servers yeah, don't work. Yeah, so it was an open beta. Um, they had 600,000 downloads in the first six days. It's <laughs> um, crazy. Just in doing like a very brief amount of research about this game, just watching somebody cover it, it, A, looked incredibly exciting. And I think the shooter, like FPS is in particular, kind of <laughs> as a genre stagnate more than others mm. where like I, I, I'll see a lot of shooters and I'll be like okay like these 10 all look pretty similar and then I'm watching footage of this and it's like I would completely have to think how I play shooters because of this mechanic that you're giving me and that is super exciting and then you go down in the, the YouTube comments right and this is anecdotal evidence but still people are like wow this is really impressive this is really fun I feel like the developers are listening and so you know they're they're generating a lot of goodwill and a lot mm-hmm. of excitement, and that's that's exactly what you need. It, uh, yep. I, th- this yep. is like this is like how video games should be. Goodwill, yeah. Yeah, that that number updated to two million people in the first fourteen days. Yeah. So yeah, huge. So it was originally it was going to launch on the twenty seventh, um, and then yeah, they pushed it into August <laughs> because of all of this craziness. Well, how do you replicate this? It, just, it. <laughs> oh yeah, that's. I'm really not talking about the question. success of everybody playing it. I'm talking about this phenomenon where people come by to play this game. It didn't work, and they're like, "Whoa, you know, like your game doesn't work." It's like that's because we're really popular. It's like, cool. Best of luck. I'll play it later. Like, gamers never do that. <laughs> Popularity <laughs> is an enticing prospect. Like, nothing will like, and you see this in gaming all the time. Like. Anytime something hot comes out and it's like we're having a closed beta or a closed alpha or whatever it is, and you go on social media, you will see like just tons and tons and tons of people begging for codes, a way to get in. You know, they'll do even contests around these things for people to try to get in, and that will get a lot of engagement. And so, like, if people can't get in to something that is getting a lot of positive buzz, they'll wait until they can get in mm-hmm. to at least see what the fuss is about. Like, it's it's definitely, like, psychology at play here. Mm-hmm. Um, some some people commented last week, actually, and uh, this might have been two weeks ago because I was not on the podcast. We talked about, you know, uh, a little bit of an exodus happening between World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV. Just, yeah. just, just yeah. a skosh. Yeah. And they said, yeah, they're like, you, you guys might have undersold that a little bit. But th- there is something about that queue window where you're like, darn it, but I'm intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're yeah. like, yeah. okay, you know, t- two hours worth of people can't be wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and it's it's crazy because I just feel like in our contemporary world, there's so much competing for your attention that you almost kind of need that extra push of like, oh, okay, a bunch of people are saying it's good. Mm-hmm. Like, it almost like is a, is a switch in your brain where you're like, okay, like, I'll make some room to pay attention to this thing. Mm-hmm. What helps with that a lot is the goodwill between the players and the developers, which yeah. is one reason you're seeing the exodus from World of oh Warcraft to Final God. Fantasy. Because people, the fans of Final Fantasy love that game. They mm. love it. Like all this stuff where they had to stop selling copies because there's too many people playing the game. Right. People are understanding. They're just excited that the game is getting popular and they're happy for the developers and will, willing to put up with some stuff. But it's like, that is the huge. That's what it sounds like with this game. Is like they love these developers, so they're willing to support them and go through some hard times. Like, yeah. well, they're not hard times, but you know the ups and downs with them. And it's like when you see companies burn bridges with their player base, like uh, or CD Project Red, antagonize them. and actively antagonize them. It's yeah. just like, well, no wonder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have there you ever been a four oh. engineers? That's for for split gate. Yeah, I mean they're gonna yeah. They for had ten a, mil, they can probably double they, that. They had to scale <laughs> from four hundred concurrent players to seventy five thousand. Good luck. 
But also, if you you know if you're this uh, um, venture capital firm, like obviously, you know, there's somebody who's like, I can, I will literally mm-hmm. launch a successful mm-hmm. game if I can just have twenty dollars worth of gas to get to this convention center. And like, there you go. Hey, yeah, sure, I'll help. Um, so yeah, I wonder specifically how they got involved and if other people, uh, other parties were involved and they just went mm-hmm. with them. But um, uh, I just let's say this happens to like X Defiant. I just don't think people will be like, hey, it's cool. <laughs> you know, like, I'll check it out later. I wonder. Well, I wonder at what size. <laughs> I wonder if it's more of a size of a company or just how long a company's been around that like that that forgiveness kind of erodes. Uh, mm. Well, Ubisoft has uh, done some things recently. Right. So uh, like, I don't. I don't think audiences like start with negative goodwill. I think like human beings like they want to be supportive. Mm-hmm. They want to play cool games they want to be into that but when you're a company like ubisoft that has like ruined people's lives right like you don't you don't get the benefit of the doubt anymore there is there is a threshold that must have been such a crazy time at the office too because early access 2019 they probably were like hitting their stride (laughs) they're like okay we think we got a good handle on this Man, even you just saying X Defiant, like that, I haven't had a game in a long time that has pissed me off so much. I haven't been in the room to talk (laughs) to you about it. And, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, man. I mean, I think the the negativity is there, and there's always going to be people that are upset when... Of course. If the servers are overloaded or whatever. I just, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of... For whatever reason, this is the one that's that's hit, and so just everybody wants to play it I mean, one way or another, you know? I feel like we haven't given this the proper credit, because when you see it in action, mm-hmm. it, it's amazing. Like, Halo with the portal gun is just awesome. Like, it's just <laughs> viscerally awesome. In X Defiant, they separated the XD because <laughs> haha, internet funny. Like, that's <laughs> that's what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. But they twisted it a little bit. They, ah. turned, it, they turned it so it looked like a, you yeah. know, its own smiley face, kind of. Watchman style. Oh, man. Brad, a, a group of devs got together, and they are creating a new studio. It's based in Los Angeles, and their name is a Star Wars reference. It's No Moon? So I thought, mm. correct. Right. Uh, so Obi-Wan. I thought it was worth, it was worth mentioning. Uh, what year did that movie come out, Jones? 1977. There it is. <laughs> I was like, that was from A New Hope, right? There. And somebody <laughs> said, whoever, one person corrected me in the comments and said, uh, not, uh, The Star Wars A New Hope came out. <laughs> the Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> a nice, pre- a nice that's, precise burn. That's a nerd battle right yeah. there. Yeah. That's what that is, yeah. I lost. Uh, they've been operating for six months already. Mm. Uh, they have just a great Annie Leibovitz style you know, like People Magazine portrait where they're all together, like almost like in black and white. You know, they're like, yes. That's such a funny photo. Yeah. That's the, you know, it's like, I just had my friend Mike come over and took pictures of us when we started these guys. Like, damn it, we should have gotten a stage. Mm-hmm. We all should have, you know, worn Armani. Uh, they specifically said in quote to the name, which is a Star Wars reference, it is a nod to, quote, a great moment in entertainment that ignited people's imaginations and delivered something truly unexpected. Um 40 people in the studio now, 100 by the end of 2022 is oh. their goal. Damn. Studios start all the time. Oh, sorry. Something is on the, the tip of your tongue, man. Oh, just uh, it's too bad they didn't uh, call it Rise of Skywalker. Maybe that, didn't, uh, <laughs> maybe that didn't have the same impact. They were going to, yeah, it's like people that named their uh, daughters Khaleesi. They were just like, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Can we? Oh, boy. <laughs> you better hope those books turn out to be good. Talking to a five-year-old. I don't know how to, <laughs> know how to break what this to books? you. books? Yeah. Ah! Someday. Uh, yeah. Maybe. How, how old do they have to be before you na- explain that name? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ben can't process <laughs> Ubisoft and Game of Thrones right now. Yeah. We can't. It's no. too much. Yeah, wait till the Ubisoft <laughs> Game of Thrones game. Studios start all the time, you know? Like, mm-hmm, yeah. uh, yes, it was a slow week, but uh, yay, there's lots of studios, there's lots of times. Shout out to gamesindustry.biz. Like, there's always, somebody's investing in this, this money's floating around there. These people have got together. Um, people are making a big, big deal about this, I think, from the pedigree, and I think from a lot of stuff that they're talking about. Those people being, the CEO is Michael Mumbauer, who's previously the head of the PlayStation Visual Arts Group. Um, I hope the f- I hope their floor of the building is interesting. I would be upset if I went to see where they worked. Visual and arts. I, I just imagine like Disney animation, you know. Yeah. It's just like oh, I want, yeah. it's, you know. I thought of Wonder statues Book and stuff for some reason. <laughs> uh, their creative director is Taylor Kurosaki, who previously served as narrative design lead at Naughty Dog and studio narrative director at Infinity Ward. The game director is Jacob Minkoff. 
Um, game director Jacob Minkoff specifically makes me think in their press release that they are working on one game right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, previously lead designer on The Last of Us. Uh, and it's left behind DLC and was the design director for 2019's Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Just ding, 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 ding. Not only right. big games, only money makers, but just like things that are just unquestionably like the the textbook definition of AAA. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have people at Bungie. We have people at Electronic Arts. Uh, obviously, people from Sony Santa Monica. Uh, and Smilegate, who I think this is the third time I brought this up in a major headline on the podcast, a South Korean company behind Crossfire. Um, and the MMO Lost Ark, which hasn't come, come out yet, is giving them $100 million um, on top of wow. you know, any other monies that they have raised. So this is poof, out of nowhere, smoke clears, AAA developer hitting, you know, already been working on something for six months. Um, hmm. uh, how excited do you get, Ben, when a new studio happens? I'll tell you how the flower I blooms and I mean, there could th- be a new AAA possibilities. Like... It's a fact that this is exactly the kind of thing that the industry needs. It needs new teams to come along to make new experiences uh, and propel the industry forward. Like, it's a, it's a necessity. And so it's awesome and it's exciting. And as you mentioned, like, that is a, an incredible pedigree. But I feel like I, I can't just, like, be, like, just, you know, rah-rah because there have been numerous – you know, people getting together projects that I thought were going to happen. And for one reason or another, they didn't, you know, whether the, the, the company itself imploded or, you know, there were creative differences or, or whatever it is, you know, I'm not saying anything specifically, but uh, like I think of Google, Google Stadia, right. And right. like all of those developers that were brought on to make original games for that platform. And that just didn't work out. And they had talent, you know, a lot of talent too. And so I am excited for them, but I just think with the, hellish and tumultuous nature of this industry and how hard it is to make a game, like, I can't help but be a little nervous for them, too. Mm -hmm. No, it's not, you know, any doubt of their credibility. It's just, it's just a rough industry. Do we, does this, have we been on an uptick with this, with a lot of people, you know, in the, in talking about Blizzard, which just, you know, seems to permeate every conversation now. Uh, There's been this, you know, massive exodus of a lot of developers leaving that are starting their own um, you know, studios, development studios, or publishing studios. Does it, does it feel like there's mo- more of those than usual? Like of these, like, oh, we, you know, we'll see what they're going to do. Like just a lot of names that are going to be coming out with something completely brand new, some crazy new IP, some new project I mean, we've never seen. There's been a bit of it, but we've also seen a lot of companies getting bought up. So I'm very glad to see new independent ventures like this. You know, even if they do have a backing of Smilegate or whatever, just to see a new team. Um, come about and yeah, again with the pedigree, you know, and, and like the the PR line that you know that gets me interested is like, you know, the singular vision of creating unforgettable stories uh, and characters that will define and extend beyond our medium, you know. So that's like that tells me like you're not trying to just make some free to play, you know, looter shooter. It's like you want to make something that's as memorable as a Naughty Dog game. You want to make a free-to-play leader shooter story. (laughs) Right. Well, this is Smilegate, so again, Crossfire and, you know, is successful. Lost Ark will most likely be successful. Um, So, yeah, they have said, like, well, we're not specifically getting into the live service, blah, 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 but it probably will be Yeah, I know, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that that is probably why Smilegate would be interested in that. Maybe. Um, I mean, but they just, you know, we don't have a whole lot of History so early in this first, process, yeah. From Smilegate, you know, we do have a lot of history for the games that these guys have made, and they seem to be more along those those kinds of lines. It's interesting that you posed the question of like, I feel like we've been seeing a lot more of this recently, and it's like yes, and it's it's an interesting way to kind of like tie this story in with other current events that have been happening because taking a look at Blizzard, for example, over the last several years, tons of top level Blizzard people have left. Uh, and and form smaller studios, right? And, you know, we've heard tumultuous reports out of Naughty Dog as well. There's a lot of Naughty Dog talent here. And so, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know exactly why these specific people or other specific people are leaving, but you have to imagine there's some correlation between mm-hmm. the environments that they work in and them leaving and, and, and you know, carving right. out their own path. So without, like, yeah, seeing any art or really having, like, a concept or really even a genre, like, there is a, you know, silver lining to this 
prospect. It just it just feels different. Like they, I usually just see like a headline, even just a name. Like some of these companies don't even have logos at the time, mm-hmm. and like they came out with like they were on the cover of GQ. You know, just like very serious. Right. Um, uh, maybe it's just they got a darn good marketing team. They just seem they just seemed like this yeah. was a, this was something that kind of turned a lot of heads this week. Yeah. I mean, the main thing that uh, this reminds me of is the uh, the guys doing the Callista protocol or whatever the mm-hmm. former visceral. Uh, guys, uh, and we kind of had a similar uh, reveal with them. It was like, okay, they're they exist and they're making some game, you know, with the PUBG guys. And we're like, what is happening? <laughs> and then we finally get this reveal, and we still don't know a lot about the game. But it's like, hey, this is like the Dead Space successor. Mm-hmm. So and now it's exciting, but it's still going to be a long time. And for this studio, it's going to be at least a year or two before we get any kind of inkling as to what they might actually put out. They're building the damn Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> the CEO, Mumbauer, said, quote, look at a game like Ratchet and Clank. It almost looks like a real-time Pixar movie. There's so much more we can do now because we've already... It does. Uh, in, in some cases, maybe better. The Pixar better. comparison is so yeah. tired at this point. <laughs> He's a CEO. He's yeah. a CEO. Um, <laughs> he's reading a script. Uh and the assets that we've created in the games can walk out of the interactive space and into the linear space in exactly the same form. They don't have to be adapted. So our stories can expand out and we can expand our audiences and tell more meaningful power of connected stories, not unlike the way Marvel does. Okay. Um, oh, God. So they, they want Netflix to just take <laughs> yeah. their character models. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened with Sonic. He just he just went right out of, you know. Straight to yeah, DeviantArt. Straight, straight, straight to DeviantArt. <laughs> he sure did expand. Really, qu- really quickly. Yeah. Yes. The fastest things he's ever done. <laughs> um, does that sound too ambitious, Brad? Is that like, okay, calm down. Oh, yeah. I'm more just like, <laughs> relax. Okay, right, like, okay. we don't know what you're doing yet. Like, it's good to be confident in your property, and but, like, them saying that doesn't do anything for me, yeah. where I believe them. Listen, it's going to look as good as Toy Story. <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe it will, but... It's hard for me to buy it right now. But you named it a Star Wars name. Best of luck to all of you. Yeah. I'm excited. Also this week, Halo is currently having a multiplayer preview. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get to see new gameplay. Uh, kind of tricky to get access to that sucker, so we will obviously... Yeah, you had to sign up right when they barely like mentioned playing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the thing we want to play. Uh, Infinite, of course. I just said Halo. You know Halo. You can just play Halo games right now. Yeah, it was... Because uh, I... I'm, Extremely excited about Halo Infinite. Love Halo. And <clears throat> it was interesting watching the comparison between the Xbox One footage and the Xbox Series X and just seeing the difference immediately uh, and how impactful that was. Uh, but Halo is, has just, like in terms of multiplayer, and this, this is both a blessing and a curse for the series, it has rev- re- like refined itself so much between games like Halo 1 is very different from Halo 2 which is very different from Halo 3 which is very different from Halo Reach and so on and so forth that like you're watching this footage and you're like I'm not really going to have an opinion on this until I play it <laughs> right like that's how different you know Halo can feel so I hope it's good man I, I know a lot of people are good. disappointed in 4 and 5 and yeah. same people so hopefully they've learned a lot it looks good so far I would, but yeah. we've been so obsessed with the visual aspect of it. It's like that game just has to feel good for me. Like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm much more, you know, uh, I mean, much more curious about that. I wouldn't I'm say worried. Much more curious about, much more curious about the campaign's about that. gonna be. I haven't seen yeah. that sucker. Yeah, just running around a world and discovering things. I could be way into that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of running around and discovering things, Death Stranding has sold five million copies on PS4 and PC together. Mm. Wow. Facebook has halted Quest 2 production over quote skin irritation. Oh, it makes me nervous because I haven't makes me opened so up my Quest nervous. 2 yet. I mean, I've used my Quest 2 a ton, and I'm, you know, these are specifically inserts. These are things that, you know, not the device itself. Waiting for it's not like fleas on it or something, but oh, like, yeah. yeah. Um, boy, that's gonna be so. <laughs> I just see it just like taking the plastic off really, really slowly. That's gonna be an event. Yes. EVGA confirmed they are replacing all the RTX 3090s that were bricked by New World. Good. Good uh, luck with that. And, and it seemed like they were going pretty quickly, too. Resident Evil perfumes are now on sale, but only in Japan. Damn. <laughs> Does a Resident <laughs> Evil perfume smell good or bad? I, right? It's got to smell it, bad, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they, well, how do you think Leon would smell? Oh, Leon smells like... Oh, yeah. Just think of how good those yes. characters are going to smell. Well, yeah, but I'm saying you could go either way, right? right? You could go... 
You, you know, how does Nemesis smell? I yeah, mean, it's true. They should do a, a monster version. Yeah, yeah. Green, green herbs and chem fluid. Right. Like, that yeah. doesn't sound like <laughs> something that I want to smell. Well, that chem fluid can heal anything. Yeah. Let me tell you. I just imagine them, like, in a lab, and they, like, drop the vial, like, <gasps> and it breaks. Oh, oh okay. It smells good. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, we're going to die, but it's not bad. PAX West 2021 has updated their safety measures to include vaccination certification. We will see like, if this that was our plan. All it, we'll see if that has an uptick in people actually wanting mm. to go to PAX. It's vaccination West. certification or uh, negative COVID test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Gamescom Indie Arena booth is going to be a three-day MMO this year. Yeah, that was nuts. Which you dug into a little bit, or uh, I watched. The is that trailer. all they said? Wait, I'm uh, sorry. Can you say that again? Gamescom Gamescom's Indie Arena booth is going to be a three-day MMO. It's going to be something that you can play, but only for Whoa. yeah. So three it's like days PlayStation Home, right? So yeah. you walk around the booths with other people, and then you go and That's see these indie wild. games. I don't know how much interaction. This is like the devolver thing on steroids. Yeah, I was, <laughs> that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, <laughs> trailers that you're watching together. I don't know what it's going to exactly all entail, but yeah. Is there going to be ERP in this? Ben, have you played Doodle Champion yes. Island games? No, uh, I've. You know, just seen it at, a, it at a glance, but I haven't actually sat down and played it yet. So I this, you know, Google does their doodles. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the most elaborate doodle they have ever done. This is a JRPG to celebrate the Tokyo Olympics. Mm. Wow. Uh, and cool. you are a, yeah, little character running around. I wonder around. if there are Dragon Quest nods in there. Lots of anthropomorphic mm. fun. Well, uh, there were uh, lots of video game nods in the opening ceremony of the 2021. Yes. Slash 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympic Games. Nintendo and Lady Gaga were apparently going to be in the opening ceremony, but backed out. Lady Gaga. Backed out is not the right or they word. Or they were going to be in the opening ceremony, they, but it's not Yeah, there were, there were plans. The people that were in charge of putting that ceremony together had stuff in their past, and so they stepped down. And so, like, the whole thing just fell apart and got reworked seemingly at the last minute, not to mention the fact that, like, the majority of people in, to- people in Tokyo think it's a terrible idea for it to be mm. happening right mm. now. So it's just like... Uh, it, because it, cause you do see like some of those shots that got leaked or whatever of just the concept and it's like, this looks ridiculous. But at the same time, if you remember the one before, the Summer Olympics before, where they kind of teased, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Mario thing at mm-hmm. the end. And it's like, oh, it could have it could have been so great if just all of this mess hadn't happened. This is probably wishful thinking, but I know Lady Gaga is a Bayonetta fan, so right. that would have been included in the performance mm. at all. All I know is they played nope. Kingdom Hearts music there. There you so go. So that's a win. Uh, also, Nintendo is regretting, uh, apparently, Dr. Mario World, which launched in July of 2019. That is the mobile arm of Dr. Mario. will be shutting down on November 1st. Oh, Yeah. That game was so forgettable. I didn't even touch that. And I play a lot of mobile games. <laughs> new Pokemon Snap added 20 new Pokemon, some new areas. If you missed that news, and I'm going to look into which we'll Pokemon adding. I added. We'll be adding, sorry. Is it free? Yeah. Oh, nice, dude. Uh, that's, and that feels like, good. That's a feel good out on the third. Announcement. Okay. And Amaterasu from Okami is coming to Monster yeah. Hunter Rise. <laughs> Tomorrow. Tomorrow. She lives on in some as way. A, as a Palamute skin. That is great. Yeah, it is Makes great. Makes a lot of sense. And they also announced that they're having more Capcom collaborations, uh, some in the near future and then some in fall, if I remember correctly. Give me a Rush Palamute skin. Yes. <laughs> Give me. Would it blend? Would it be like the world? Would it like blend into the... Well, would it be like be made of wood or something? Or like Collab yeah. uh, with in Monster Hunter World, and the way that they did it is your Palico was like... It was like a voxel Mega Man. So <laughs> it was like 3D... Mm-hmm. Yeah, they could do that with Rush. Bit, yeah. It is time for Love and Respect. Love Love and Respect. respect. From Rahul Masal, with news of Animal Crossing getting an update soon, what Switch games do you think would most benefit from some late DLC? Specifically late DLC. (laughs) Super Mario Odyssey. Mario Odyssey. Super Mario Odyssey. (laughs) Oh. Yeah. Hands down. Hands down. Not even a question. Yep. There's, but there's like nothing later than that like that Mario the Super Mario Party thing man like that just I mean at this point yeah, that uh, just, Mario Odyssey would be later yeah but uh, oh you know the other one I was thinking of was the uh, Bowser's Fury mm. adding that to 3D World it's like yes but technically that was a there's a re-release you yeah. re-release and that bundled together but yeah 
to be in. But yeah, you because you would have thought that something like that would have yeah would have been tied to Odyssey, not right. 3D World. But man, right. Um, Breath of the Wild. It'd be neat to have like DLC that maybe leads you into yep. Breath of the Wild too. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, uh, more tropical freeze DLC too. Sure, yes, throw that dude. my way. Th- you could throw some more Kongs in yeah, there. Throw some you more could Kongs. throw some more Kongs in I, there. I do like I do like that kind of thing though when they do a little little tease. You know, you, this is an update and like yeah. what's we're going on the subtle Resident Evil two yes, thing. Yes, Resident Evil yeah. two hearing nemesis. Yeah. Uh, was Luigi's Mansion last yes. October? Or October before that. Luigi's Mansion three. Oh my God, Luigi's. I was, was playing before that. Uh. When I was at home in Iowa, I was playing Luigi's Mansion three co-op uh, with my nephew, and it that game is so goddamn good. Yes, <laughs> it's yes. great. Mm-hmm. You've just even one more floor. Yes. Go to the parking lot. In the DLC. <laughs> From Sarah Knight, a name that you might. Be familiar with first time ever writing into yeah. the Easy Eyes podcast wow. while watching the Tokyo Lovely. Olympics ceremony opening ceremony. The last thing I'd ever expect was a video game music being played over the Parade of Nations. I nearly lost my mind as soon as I heard the Dragon Quest theme and then got emotional afterwards as I heard more of my favorite franchises being represented during one of the biggest events in the world. Mm-hmm. One thought I had afterwards was a quote said by none other than Ben Moore during the E3 2017 Sony press conference when Monster Hunter World was revealed and Ben mm-hmm. said, The world will finally understand. Do you think this will bring people at all to at least check out video game music as a genre or be put to the wayside and thought of as nothing more than a fun thing to have during the ceremony? Hmm. Was this an event? Was this an event for video game soundtracks around the world? Maybe. Like, if they didn't know about that as a video game. Like, if it's just some random person hearing it for the first time and they don't know it's a video game thing, then probably not. But if there's someone they know who was like, hey, that's a video game song, we're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I... I don't know, hard question to answer because I do feel like video games have kind of truly punctured through sort of like the mainstream bubble, and, and it, it is kind of like a a widely appreciated thing now. It feels like no matter who you are, you play video games in some capacity, and I think a lot of people that grew up on things like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy or whatever it is, or Zelda, are now getting older and sharing that with their families, and so it... I, I, it's just growing and growing and growing and growing. But I think for it to be recognized that something like the Olympics of all things is a huge deal and opens it up, I think, for other huge events to kind of do the same thing. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think it's important. It's hard to predict exactly how this will affect things moving forward, but we'll have to see. Super Bowl. I, like... You say that, and I don't think it's impossible. It's not. Not, mm-hmm. not maybe not right now, but ten years from now. Mm-hmm. I've seen yeah. some college football band tributes right. to various video game franchises yeah. in marching band form, but uh, never. Oh my god, dude! Like at like whatever the biggest NASCAR event is or something, you play Mario Kart music or <laughs> <Yeah>. something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like I, I love thinking of like somebody from you know just somebody from any country that just knows nothing about games, is not interested in mm-hmm. games, and is just kind of walking out like, okay, this is you know I'm all about this sport. This is I'm just focused on you know doing as best as I can to represent my country, and just some nerd just in the back who's just like you know stoked to be in the Olympics, but like oh my god, I'm walking out to Dragon Quest right now. I can't believe this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I think about like my parents, Jones. Like they don't really know anything about video games, <laughs> and I said they played music from the Olympics, the video games, and they're like, oh okay. Like, yeah. They just don't care. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I guess to me, the only thing that like I could potentially see more of would be, you know, like a Philharmonic schedule or t- something along those lines. You know, some something that's not just oh, a video games live or some other like big touring event that's like deliberately doing this, but you know, actually, you know, those kinds of of, of orchestras. Nobuo Uematsu, next year's Super Bowl, man. He's going to be the right. halftime show. Oh, my God. Yeah. Dude, his dance choreography yeah. is going to be sick. Yeah. Or just sneak into, like, other, like, I want to go to the Hollywood Bowl to listen to, like, Mozart. And then right at the end, they're like, for no reason at all, Symphony of the Night. Just one yeah. track. Just for, and we're like, oh. And everyone's like, I can't, yeah. It would be really funny, funny, though, then. if they started off with the more classical type stuff. Yeah. And then just broke out the Black Mages. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Black Mages is some of the best. I, oh, I love it. Yes. 
From Leo S. Luna, do you like watching the Olympics? What are your favorite sports? If so, would you like any of those sports to have focused mini uh, video game or at least a Yakuza style mini game? And if so, which one would it be? Uh, this could be Summer Olympics, could be Winter Olympics, doesn't it? Have to just mm. be. Uh, so I've been getting really into skateboarding, and this is the first year that skateboarding is at the Olympics, and so I've been watching that specifically, and I've honestly been having the time of my life. Like, it's so much fun uh, to watch, and it is incredible because on the women's side, they had like two or three women that made it to the finals of the skateboarding competition that were 13 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about a lot of those Olympic athletes. They're yeah. very young. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, I think there's some uh, locals, like SoCal locals. That mm. are yeah. In, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Too. yeah. 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 Uh, U.S. took bronze uh, for men. Mm -hmm. This just in. Yeah. Uh, how long ago was that? Oh, like a couple days ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> old news by now. Yeah. Yeah. It'd certainly be old news by Japan. Well, take, taking the gold, men skateboarding, and then Brazil. Uh, uh, that's mm. I did know that. I yeah. did. Yeah, I did have a friend. Yeah. Um, so I was really happy that my home country won the gold medal. <laughs> right. <it's true. laughs> Represent. Um, yeah, I, I I go back and forth. This year it, it hasn't uh, hasn't grabbed me. That you know I, I just haven't. You know, I don't know, just the the access, the way that I have TV and stuff right now, it's kind of weird. It's not normal. It hasn't grabbed everybody. Yeah. Apparently but, ratings um, are down. But yeah. we're all at home watching entertainment, right, Ben? Why aren't people? Well, I, I don't have cable either. I've been watching it on Peacock. It's a little tricky to, to watch, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Which but, like, I don't even have, like, a, a regular over-the-air yeah. TV right now. Like, sure. everything I watch is on this thing right, right. now. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> I'm just in a weird place TV-wise. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, usually I get pulled more into it by my wife because she had, um, she worked the Atlanta Olympics uh, and oh. the broadcast team for that. So it's just something that's very mm. personal to her. Uh, so she, she gets really excited about it. From a critical perspective, yeah. is she like, not what I would have Sometimes. <laughs> I don't. Sometimes. <laughs> I don't know where I saw it, but there was this great online post that somebody said, like, the men's curling team just look, they look like a bunch of dads that were trying to get away from their families for the weekend that ended up competing in the Olympics. And you look at them and you're like, that is so spot on. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's great. Oh, it brought me so much joy. What is the long jump on skis? What is that just insane big wooden contraption? Oh my God. That death trap thing? That's what is, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. That and the luge yeah, are like. having a specific name? They're just like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's yeah, just so insane. Nuts. They fly so far. It's like you shot out of a cannon. <laughs> um, way back, man, it's been like 20 years ago because I was living in Culver City at the time. I was watching. Uh, at all crazy hours, you know, watching the Olympics. And this guy, you, you got to like shimmy out across to get on this, the you know, to jump down off this thing. And this guy in the loudest orange jumpsuit I've ever seen in my entire life is just very slowly moving across. And the room is dead quiet. And one guy in the back says, orange, you glad you're in the Olympics? And that's one of the funniest things yeah, that's great. I have ever heard anyone say. Uh, Brandon, you talk about people for a while. doing crazy things. Last night, I watched a, a skateboarding video where this guy on a skateboard, jumped over the Great Wall of China. <laughs> like, these people are insane. Yes. yes. It's really cool. Yeah. You should check it out. Well, I mean, in the in the digital age, where we're, st we're still pretty wowed by, like, a crazy-looking monster or some cool stunt yeah. or something in a movie, it's nice to be like, whoa. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> that crazy person did that. From Cody Spencer, more Olympic talk. I've been diving into watching as much of the Olympics as I possibly can, and it's been the main thing on my mind lately. So I bring my Olympic obsession to love and respect. In the Easy Allies of the Olympic Games video game, what event would each ally participate in? Can it be a winter or summer event or have fun uh, and make up a new event? Whatever skiing rifle thing you do, whatever that would be. Exactly guns, thinking, that's yeah. huge. Or just shotgun, just like, yeah, like James Bond. Because, and the reason that sticks in my head is, it's not because I actually saw it in the Olympics. Yeah. It's because it was on, like, the winter games that I had on mm. Commodore 64 mm. <laughs> on a floppy disk. You know? uh, that was one of the games in there. Mm. But it would be, like, characters from Doom. You know, and Papa. Just Huber's oh, gonna take my God. Out. That'd be so sick. I would do archery. Brad, what are you feeling? Uh, I mean, are, are these, like, fantasy events that we're making? Anything. Up? Okay. I'm boring and picking archery. I would archery. probably do snowboarding, I guess. From the winter, I didn't even know skateboarding was the first time this year. First time, that's yeah. pretty sick. I used to skate a lot back in the day, so maybe that too. Yeah, 
Uh, like, fantasy pick, monster hunting. Absolutely. <laughs> I want that to be an Olympic arena. Great. Event. Yeah, you have like an, arena, an Olympic arena. Uh, if it were real, I would love to do skateboarding. I, to- I super suck. I'm a total beginner, but I, I well, would, would have fun. Would you do vert or street? Street. Same. Yeah, I haven't. I I'm haven't, not going on. I haven't tried. I haven't even attempted to learn vert yet, dude. It's, it's yeah. scary. I I'm a total it's noob. It's scary. Yeah, it is. It, it's terrifying. Yeah. And you like you see people do it, and you're like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. And then just like even like just a little curb when you get up to it, you're like, oh no, this is really scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I should let you guys borrow the ridiculous movie I participated in several years back. <laughs> what? Did someone jump over Bar? you? Is there like only one copy ever made? I mean, I don't, I don't know if you could buy it. Please tell me uh, that's what happened. But it's called Dropping In, and it's like it's it's kind of like a it's mockumentary, um, and it's it's a guy who was like yeah it, it, in his late forties like getting back into skating and oh. and, act, and believing he was going to like oh be like top tier, but that's like, everybody around him was like, dude, are you even practicing? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so, that's funny. It takes tons yeah. of practice. Yeah. So yeah, I, was, I worked as a script supervisor. Oh really? That's a real, hilarious. Real low budget, like that, friends getting together kind of movie. That's a really funny. Yeah. Do you have a Do you have a business card? Is that a thing? Like a side <laughs> side gig? You just go, so that's you not something I've done for years. Dude, got, Did you enjoy the process? Or you, you you've got things? multiple business cards. You got your Easy Business card. You got <laughs> yeah, your Nintendo, Nintendo business yeah. card, and now you've got your <laughs> consultant, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, movie consultant. Time for bets. Next week's bet, Lemnisgate, launches next Tuesday, August 3rd. When we record our podcast next week, how many minutes will have elapsed between the most recent and second most recent tweets from the Lemnisgate game account on Twitter? One day is 1,440 minutes. These are going to be honest-to-goodness tweets, not replies, not retweets. Brad Ellis. Going low, 120. Nice. (laughs) Ben Moore. Going super low, then 50. Ooh. That's right. 50 minutes. Daniel Clubber. 121. How dare you? <laughs> 999. Wow. Um, so wait. Gate and split gate. What timing? A lot of gates. I know. A lot of gates. What was your? Just can't, are you are you higher than Brad? or what? Yeah. One, one minute one, higher one than minute me. Higher. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I say, I price, price is right. Watch today. Keep those tweets coming. This week's bet, on on Tuesday, July 27th, Capcom released The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. In the first 10 reviews on Open Critic, uh, how many times did I see the word objection? Clarification, these are only the reviews in English. Michael Damiani bet five. Ben Moore bet 10. Isla Hink bet four. Daniel Bloodworth bet four. I didn't bet nothing because I was sleeping. (laughs) And I haven't done this yet, but I'm going to do it right now. And I did it. Looked at 10 websites. They were all in English. Metro Game Central had one review. GameSpot had one. Oh, sorry. One mention of it. Guardian had two. ZTGD had one. Worth Playing had one. A lot of people had one. Digitally Downloaded and PC Gamer managed to abstain. But GameSpew, Noisy Pixel, and Eurogamer all had one. Nine total, closest to Ben Moore's score of ten. There it is. Mm, I knew I was... This is the first bet that I was confident in. (laughs) Bringing our scores to Jovial Penguins, 19. (laughs) Wow. Vociferous Beavers, 13. Nom, 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 nom. Mm. It's not looking good. Let me tell you about Patreon.com slash Easy Allies. Patreon.com is looking great. We're not looking good because we're six points behind. That's why, that's why I said that. I didn't mean to bring things down before I went into Patreon. I'm not looking forward to the, the rest of the bets for the rest of the year because I don't think, maybe just me, though I can't pull it around. But we are supported on patreon.com slash easy allies. It's where you can go to support this very podcast. You can get the podcast two days early on Friday. If you're used to listening to this on Sunday, you also get no ads in the Patreon version. For just a dollar on Sundays, you can get that no ad version. And a little bit extra of love and respect, our $5 and above Q&A portion of the podcast. Thank you to everybody that supports us. You can learn a lot more about Patreon, uh, about easy allies through Patreon. I encourage you to go check it out. Thanks so much for the reading for the last time to our shout out tier for this month specifically, for the month of July 2021. This is our very top tier on Patreon. I love each and every one of these people. Shout out to Blue, Caleb Togi Crawford, Dave McKilligan, Edsger, So I'm a Spider, So What, El Fanis, Esdocal, Greg the Dark Knight Kettering, and Nick. Shout out. Shout out. 
Ben, why don't you wrap up this podcast? All you right. get to promote any Easy Allies video you'd like to promote. You get the final word on anything you disagreed with, want to reiterate, or just popped into your head. And you get to sign off with your trademark sign off. All right. A um, little risky doing this because we haven't actually done it yet. But I'm very excited about it. Uh, Friday, it was probably by the time you're watching this, Friday at 5 p.m., so either watch it live or watch the vibe, VOD, we are doing a Final Fantasy XI stream. Uh, it'll be myself, Bradley Ellis, Michael Damiani, uh, and Michael Huber. And uh, having played it a little bit in preparation, that game is a trip in a lot of ways. It's a blast from the past. It's so antiquated in ways that I think will make for a fun and entertaining stream. I know people are really excited about it. I am personally very excited about it. Scheduled this whole thing. And so, yes, just watch that. If you want, like, good ally vibes, I think. <laughs> I don't know, but I think this will be and lots of confusion. And lots of confusion, yeah. But jolly confusion. Mm -hmm. um, anything I want to reiterate. Um, don't phone in this Pokemon series. If, if you could if you could make it good, I think that would be very special to a lot of people. And Sophie is our supreme ruler. Sorry, I was thinking about Spider-Man. What game did you say? A new God of War. Oh, okay. A new God of War. Well, how do you think Leon would smell? The Easy Allies would like to thank our Patreon podcast producers. We apologize in advance for all the ally names we are about to misspell and mispronounce. Blue, Caleb Togi Crawford, Dave McKilligan, Edsger So I'm a Spider So What, El Thanis, Estocal, Greg the Dark Knight Kettering, Nick, Walker Hope, Will Schmuck, Alex AI, Alexander Zirianov, Alexandra Reyes, Ali Cat, Beaten Down Brian, Bradley Spees, Dave Red, Discarded Digit, Douglas Chomich, Freya Lawson, Hayden Hargraves, Happy Gaming, Jay She, Jose Gutierrez, Miguel Rivas, Nicholas Johnson, Paolo Costabel, Richard G. Flowers, Rob Bob Will, Robert Stoffel, Roy Sung, Sage Mode Q, Samsa Stormbomb, Sigma, S Snake 24, Jesse Blue, Chum Nguyen, Valmar, Angelo De Elia, Aurelian Grenier, Brandon White, Brian Kruger, Dale Sun, Gary James, G. Levin, James Vitt, Jan Tyson, Jesper Popmel Dufay, John Burns, Kroldemort, Leif, Luke Bennett, Mango, Marcel Markov, Mark J. Betters II, Matthew Holcomb, Matthew Pauling, Nathan Watkins, Oni Blackmage, Pete Shoemaker, Robert Crouch, Ryan Anderson, Sam Hendrick, Stepan Hakobian, Stephen Thomason, The Banana Forklift Killer, Todd Yurkovic, Rack, Zachary Wingate, 44 Stars, Accounts Payable, Adam Henry, Adam Sharonbrock, Ahab, Ahmed Al Rashed, Alex Glass, Alex Monaco, Alexander Irving, Allison Burt, Andreas Risberg, Andre, Andy Marks, Anthony Galvin, Austin, Barry, Beastmaster 64, Bjornor Haraldsvik, Blake Bonsack, Bread Roll Art, Brian Foster, Briscoe Davis, Brittany Fuller, Bunny Chen, C.S. Lewis, Katie Garza, Chase Caldwell, Candy Coated Thorns, Chief Uhu, Chris the Pianist, Christian Semniak, Christian Hundorf, Christoph Fatui, Christopher Santis, Clay Roberts, Cody Westley, Colin Hoyleman, Corey Jackson, Corey Landega, Crediar, Culinary Stud, Cyberboa, Dakota Hayes, Damnable Nook, Dan Sebring, Daniel Fuchs, Daniel Wong, Dan Pan 16, David Barishaj, David Wilson, David Boyarski, Delisi, Dimitri Zetis, Don Turner, DRD7 of 14, Edison S. Prada Jr., Eric Maynard, Eric Tobias, Eric Gustafson, Espen Gotchman, Ethan Satz, Ethereal Ether, Faraz Rizvi, Fishflop, Forest, From the Void, Gabriel Aberg, Glenn Olson, Gustav Strombaum, Hadi Ali, Haley Hill, Harrison Holt McHale, Helen Y, Hitman 47, Ison Chor, Ian Anderson, Isaac Swanson, 
Jai Aldiar, Jamison Lapine, Jana, Jason I, JC3, Jeffrey Ruchtenwald, Jeremy Ferris, Jesse Fish, Jesse Wilkison, Jethrin, Joe Frantic, Joel Short, Joey Din, John Gallagher, Jojo Denko, Jonathan and Amy Alconis, Jordan Phillips, Joshua Vanswall, Jose Carlos Madrigal, Julius Garcia, Junya Motomura, Justin Payne, Carl Williams, Knocking Nick, Kevin Gillet, Lars Berger, Lee Young, Leon Keyes, Lindsey Wells, Linson Wu, Liam Ahern, Luis Ibarra, Lion Crown 19, Mikey Moe, Malcolm Moschette, Malianware, Manuel Thomas, Marcel Giru 17 Frolic, Marco Hernandez, Materia Addict, Matthias Clare, Matt Ferguson, Matt Karwaski, Matthew Holmes, Matthew T. Ryan, Mazrim Tame, Megadet, Megan McDonough, Michael Bisegli, Michael Clendenan, Michael Kozachenko, Michael Pliskin, Michelle Nub, Miguel, Mikhail Aniel, Mike Calvi, Mike Hook One, Mikey Mizek Novak, Misuki Two on One, Mithers Strongbeard, Mo Grant, Monica, Morpheus, Mr. Anarchy, Nefertiti Jenkins, Neil Bruce, Nycrypt, Nevi Sun, Noah Weinstein, Ulf himself, Oru Gacino, Pablo Rodriguez, Patrick Embush, Paul Nolson, Paul Sway, Philip Higdon, Quinn Riley, Rafael David Aquilino Baki, Raymond Lee, Reed Johnson, Richard Goodwin, Ritz 1906, Robert I, Roy Eschke, Russell Bateman, Ryan Wagner, Ryan Curtin, Sam Sorensen, Samuel Copeland, Sean Cornett, Sebastian Urban, Sebastian Trier, Silent Consonant, Sneaky Gato, Spencer Stevens, Splontot, Stefan Hines, Stone Cold Steve Carson, Strikeout NZ, Super 3D Cow, T Beaks 15, Tense George, The Classiest Hobo, Tim Strothman, Thomas Blaze Fochero, Tim Mann, Tim O'Keefe, TJ Sullivan, Toasty Soul, Tom Masterman, Travis Gikowski, Travis Ng, Travis Miosi, Trevor Thomas, Tristan Howard, Trizak, Tuttle, Tyler Wallace, V8 Dave, V Kira Ray, Volker Bach, Wavy Chula, Willow Pingree, Wobess, Wouter DeHaze, ZK.